Greetings, dear chess fans and experts. This is Feedmaster Max Omeriv with you. Today we're going to be looking at the immortal game of Adolf Anderson. This great game is among the small number of games that have been given a name. They're immortalized in history. It was played in 1851. This is the 19th century. Before I start analyzing this game, I'd like to talk a bit about the chess player himself. Adolf Anderson because he was actually the first world champion. So he was the strongest chess player in the first half of the 19th century, in the early 19th century. So here's his brief story. When you watch this game, you'll realize that you play chess stronger than the strongest chess player of the 19th century. Really, in every move, there'll be a mistake. Now you'll see. In every move, the opponents made serious mistakes. Adolf Anderson was born in 1818 and died in 1879 in Breslau, Germany. In addition to being a consummate chess player, he also achieved the degree of Doctor of Science, Professor of Mathematics, because it was hard to live off chess at that time. And every strong chess player had some other part-time job or main job in addition to chess. For example, the second world champion Emmanuel Lasker also had a PhD. So all chess players of that epoch were engaged in something else besides chess, and they achieved the highest results in both spheres. Anderson was the strongest chess player at that time before Wilhelm Steinitz came in. He lost a game against Steinitz and since then Steinitz has been considered the strongest chess player, so I think we're sufficiently familiar with Adolf Anderson. All in all, he was the strongest chess player of that era and also a doctor of science. Let's see how the strongest played in the 19th century. There was a king's gambit which changed into a bishop's gambit. The third move is bishop c4. Now the main move is knight f3, bishop c4, queen h4, check. This is such a sharp variation. White immediately gets deprived of castling and left without a pawn, but they try to create a counterattack on black's king. You'll see in a moment. Actually, this is a semi-correct variation for white. I don't recommend playing it that way. We want to see the beauty that happened in this game. b5. This is the counter-sacrifice of a pawn in order to develop the bishop to b7 and also to distract the white bishop from f7. This move has two goals. In modern practice, the move d6 is more common to be able to develop the bishop to g4 and so on, meaning that d6 is a more natural move. b5 actually isn't bad either. An interesting sacrifice. Bishop b5, knight f6. Knight f3, queen h6. We won't go through a number of sub-options here. An in-depth analysis could, of course, take up to two hours. We'll only go to the essence of this game, the beauty, d3. Knight h5. It becomes clear right away that this move is somewhat strange and questionable. The knight goes to the edge of the board, but it has, of course, a clear idea, to play knight g3. For example, on the move like knight c3, you can play knight g3 check. If we take this knight, black takes the rook on h1, so the move knight h5 has a specific threat. Here he should have played just rook g1, so there was no more move knight g3. He forfeited the castling privilege anyway, so the move rook g1 is not that scary. But here Anderson played knight h4. Here we have a series of bad moves. With each move, opponents start to make mistakes. Queen g5 is the right move. This is a fork on the knight and on the bishop. Knight f5, c6. Move g6 would have been stronger here to dislodge the knight. Say, if knight retreats to d4, we can just play bishop g7. And then if white takes the knight, we can just capture the bishop. In general, g6 was easier. Of course, there are some tricks after h4 for white. There could be this kind of variation. Let me fast forward, because it'll take a long time to analyze this all. And at the end of the variation, black has an extra pawn. In general, they have a good position. Black has an advantage. But c6 followed. This move is not accurate. And then g4. Such a move would not even occur to a good second category chess player, but that was the way the strongest chess players played back then. g4. This move, of course, is extremely doubtful. He should have just removed the bishop on a4, and there was quite an interesting game. Knight to g3, because you can't play fg here. Because the queen hangs on g5. The game is almost level here. Then after g4, some mess begins but it leads to this immortal game. Knight f6. That's not the best move either. It was easier to play g6, like this. 
the strongest move here is d6. The point is that after gh, we will have h3 check. If you can't keep up with what's going on, I recommend that you pause the video. Take your time to think about it, because really the positions are not simple. They're not patterned at all. It's very difficult to understand everything on the go. Well, I think I don't need to explain why we shouldn't take the bishop right away, because in this case, white will simply win back the piece. That's why d6 is the strongest move here, and here, black simply has a one position. Knight f6 followed, and here the fight gains a new shape. Rook g1, cb. Another mistake. h5 would have been stronger. Let's go back to what happened in the game, because all these variations will drive us nuts. h4, queen g6, h5, queen g5, queen f3. The move bishop beats f4 with the queen wins is threatening, so we need to give the queen away in right away. Knight g8. Bishop f4, queen f6. The queen gets out from under the strike. Knight c3 and bishop c5. This is a questionable move. It was stronger to play, say, bishop b7, not to let play knight d5. In general here, black is without a piece. White has compensation. In general, we have a fierce struggle going on here. But after bishop c5, wild complications began. Knight d5. Again, this move is not the best. It was better to play d4. Here's the point of the move. Let's say after bishop b6, we play just bishop e5, and on the g7, pawn is in danger. And after bishop d4, we play knight d5. And the bishop hangs. Queen can't hold it. The queen has to retreat. So we just take the bishop. So bishop c5 just loses right after d4, but Anderson plays knight d5. Queen b2, bishop d6. Again, it's an irrational move. It was better to play d4. In this case, white still had an advantage. After this variation, mate is threatening on f7. We have to go f6, and after f6, we beat the pawn. Well, the game could have ended like this. Queen f7, checkmate. The variations are complicated, to be honest, so we won't go through them thoroughly. Bishop d6, bishop beats g1. A question mark. It was better to play queen a1, and here we have this position. It's not easy. White has no rooks now. Here they win it back. Well, in the end, in the end there was some kind of equality. This is a completely incomprehensible and broken position. In general, you wouldn't wish your worst enemy to be in such a position. After bishop g1, all the beauty appeared. White sacrificed one rook and the second rook, and the game ended with a beautiful mate in three moves. Knight g7, queen f6, and bishop e7 mate. This is the immortal game. Due to this final position, the game went down in history as immortal. So what have we here? White is without a queen, two rooks and a bishop but they mated the black king with three of their pieces. The end result is really beautiful. Well, as we saw in the game, Anderson just blundered everything and so did his opponent. Yeah, that blundered way too much. But it was beautiful. So friends, write in the comments whether you like this game or not, whether it deserves the immortal title, or maybe you think some other games are worthy of this title. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet, Give this video a like and don't forget to hit the bell button as well to make sure you don't miss any of the upcoming videos. Keep playing and studying chess and I'll see you soon.